We're very fortunate to have with us. Uh, he's actually is a superstar in sports marketing. Uh, John Spolstra, he's a member of the advisory board for the sports enterprise management right here at the University of Washington. John, thank you very much for spending time with us. Stan, and I'm delighted to. You, um, you have had uh, positions with several teams in the marketing side, and I think you started out with Notre Dame basketball. Uh, well, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's a long story, but that's my greatest success and my greatest failure. <laughs> we have to hear about that then. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to take longer than the time you have, but uh, uh, I had set up independently the largest television, independent television network in the country at the time. This was in the mid 70s, just to televise Notre Dame basketball games. And we went to 119 TV stations across the country. Wow. Um, but, and unfortunately, it didn't work out. Well, uh, you know, uh, Notre Dame basketball had definitely had some tremendous successes, that's for sure. Uh, but with with the NBA teams that you were with, uh, I won't go through each one of them, but will you tell us from a marketing standpoint uh, what the big difference is between when you started in the 70s and what it is today, with the exception of the COVID-19, which is a whole other story. Well, Stan, the biggest difference is the amount of employees a team has. I joined the Portland Trailblazers in 1979 as VP Marketing, and I was their 10th employee. A typical NBA team these days has 150, 200 employees, and that doesn't include stadium or arena employees. Oh my uh, gosh. And if you take a look at uh, the travel squad, the team used to travel with 12 players, one head coach, one assistant coach, one trainer, that was it. So it's like 15. The travel squads now for an NBA franchise are 38 to 40 people because you have 15 players instead of 12. You have, still have one head coach. Now you have like five or six assistant coaches. You've got at least two trainers, at least two weight, uh, uh, weight people. And then you've got the radio and TV announcing crews, which would mean announcers, maybe three for each, plus uh, the production people. And oh, and a, a, a two security people. And I probably forgot some, but that probably adds up to about 38 or 40. So that's the biggest difference is just the amount of people that are now employed by each NBA team. Wow. So and, of then... course, and of course, the dollars are way different. Yeah, uh, it would seem then it would put an awful lot of pressure on the marketing staff because you know you're largely responsible for bringing in revenue. Right. Uh, that's why, uh, like when I came into the NBA, there were no teams that employed somebody to sell tickets. I mean, it was their primary job. You might have somebody who would take a group sales ticket. To, or there'd be somebody in the box office that would take the order. But there wasn't somebody that would aggressively go out and market tickets. Now, uh, after my stint with the Blazers, I joined the New Jersey Nets, now the Brooklyn Nets. And that was in, as a consultant in 1990. And they were an awful team, they had an awful past. Uh, they had, had the worst attendance in the league for seven straight years uh, and the worst record in seven straight years. They had four guys that sold both sponsorships and tickets. Well, <laughs> what would happen is they w nobody would sell tickets because sponsorships was uh, a more uh, ideal type of thing to sell than tickets to a losing team. And we, in two years, we ramped that up to 20 ticket salespeople calling exclusively on corporations in Northern New Jersey. And that was sort of a shot heard throughout the NBA. Like a couple of years ago, I think the Philadelphia 76ers had a hundred ticket salespeople. Wow. And we went, we went uh, to 20 and that was like, that was like uh, just one of the most amazing things in the NBA. People just couldn't believe that we would have 20 ticket salespeople. And a lot of the interesting, a lot of the leaders in the industry today started in that New Jersey, New Jersey Nets group. Uh, Brett Yormark, who was, 
uh, president of the New Jersey Nets for a uh, number Brooklyn Nets for a number of years. Howie Newchouse, who's uh, the head of CAA, the large uh, representative agency. And um, O'Neill, uh, he's now the president of the Philadelphia 76ers. Mm -hmm. They yeah. all started in that group of 20. So um, I have to ask this question. I mean, how did they make money before? Just because they were there? Yeah, there wasn't. First of all, the salaries weren't great for the NBA teams. And teams could sort of break even or they didn't lose a lot of money. And when, when the salary started to rise and, okay, if you had a, the Portland Trailblazers, when they won the championship in 77, they mm -hmm. had no ticket salespeople. Really? <laughs> and they ended up just by demand in the Portland area of selling every ticket to every game for 1978, 79 season and for the eight or nine seasons after that. Um, the Boston Celtics, when they had Larry Bird and, and that group, they didn't have any ticket salespeople. It was just the demand. And the feeling was that if you won, that you'd sell out. But there were a lot of instances where that wasn't the case. So then teams started to do some marketing of tickets and do some work behind it. Now it's become very sophisticated uh, for most of these teams. And they have big staffs. When you, you talk about it's becoming sophisticated, uh, what do you mean? What are some of the sophisticated aspects to selling tickets? It's not just you know, getting on the phone and calling somebody and say, hey, you want to buy some tickets to the game? No, no, not at all. Uh, they've got software that can pretty much ferret out who the best prospects would be. And then you go after them. Um, and social media is big with uh, ticket sales departments now. Um, I still think the best way is the old fashioned way but just go out and see a client, you know, and talk to them about, or a prospect about the advantages of, of a, working with a team uh, through some type of ticket package. In terms of the marketing department though, uh, a big part of your job, I would think, would, would be the evolution of the television package. I know right. there's, a, there's an NBA package, but there's also a local package. A too. local package. And that's why how I got into the NBA is uh, this is 1979. Larry Weinberg, the owner of the Trailblazers at the time, hired me as a one-day consultant. And he said, we won the championship in 1977. And the next year, our rights fee for radio and television went down. And I said, really, and this is interesting, is that 1978-79, the Portland Trailblazers had the third best radio, in those days, radio stations would pay a rights fee to broadcast the games. They would assume all the expenses and they would uh, pay a fee to the team and then they'd keep whatever profit there was. And that, that year, 78, 79, the Trailblazers had the third highest income from a rights fee of any team in the NBA. And that was $25,000. Oh my gosh. Shows you how the dynamics have changed. But they brought me in as a VP marketing. That was my first job, was to bring radio in-house. And interestingly, in those days, there wasn't the wordage in-house. You know, we just started to do radio ourselves. And I can't remember when I first heard in-house uh, or if I uttered it, when I uttered it. But that first year, we see, we had a lot of advantage of selling over from a radio station. The radio station was just selling commercials. Well we could include season tickets with a, with a sponsorship. Or we could include a player appearance. We could include a lot of different things. And that first year when we brought it in house is instead of a net net of $25,000 to the Blazers, we had made a $900,000 profit. Oh my gosh. That was the shot heard around the NBA for that because we made more money little Portland, Oregon off of radio than the rest of the NBA combined. Wow. 
things have changed then, haven't they? It's it's not negative towards Portland. It's just that media is um, is the big kahuna from um, a revenue standpoint now, isn't it? Yeah, now it's cable. You know, cable do local dollars are are very big. But now it seems that in the NBA, at least, that the dollars from Asia are starting to dwarf your local dollars. So like the money from China to televise the games, uh, that created a, a large spike in the salary cap. I mean, it, the salary cap went up, what, $10 million in one year because of that negotiated contract with China. Well, that's more than teams make locally. Now, the, some of the teams locally, like the Knicks and the Lakers, because of the markets are so large and it's pay cable, uh, they outstrip whatever Portland could do or the smaller markets could do. 